Hello everyone, welcome to uh, RICS 5, Bob. Um, background, background Cascadian will be presenting this session. Thank you. Um, <laughs> hello, uh, it's so great to see a pretty uh, good turnout. Um, I am uh, mostly a RISC V cheerleader. I don't have a huge amount of background in ISA development or anything like that, but uh, I'm pretty excited about the prospects and uh, wanted to get together and chat about it with other people. Uh, I'm trying to leave the IRC session open on here, so if anybody sees a question uh, that, that can be brought to my attention, um, feel free to highlight vagrancy and IRC on the DevConf 18-Z uh, uh, room. Uh, and then we'll try and get more uh, remote participation and engagement. Uh, basically, um, uh, I'm mostly, I don't have a lot of slides prepared for this uh, at all, really. Uh, but uh, I just uh, I'm going to go over the wiki, the wiki page on wikidebianorg slash riskv uh, or risk 5 as it's supposed to be pronounced. Uh, so risk 5 is an open source instruction set architecture based on established reduced instruction set computing risk principles. Um, so this is uh, kind of a more low level opening the hardware at the processor level, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, we've made a lot of progress on RISC-V just in the last six months. Um, uh, so this is a fairly new port. It's currently in the Debian ports repository. Um, there is a 64-bit variant of RISC-V is basically what's being targeted initially. and quite possibly for the foreseeable future. Uh, the status is roughly, it's been hovering at about, let's see here, I believe it's been hovering around 80% complete, give or take a little, uh, for the last several months, which is pretty impressive for a very important. Uh, a lot of thanks to the people who've been doing a lot of work on bootstrapping to make that a lot easier. Uh, there is the riskv.org website um, and upstream mailing lists. The toolchain support is pretty widely, uh, almost all of the major important toolchains uh, already have support. Uh, the notable lack is GDB. If uh, there are any people interested in doing GDB hacking, uh, we would love to have people working on the RISC-V port for that. Uh, there's actual real-world hardware in actual real uh, Debian community hands, which is pretty exciting. Um, the Hi5 Unleashed is the main board, which was unveiled at, earlier this year at FOSDEM, if I remember correctly. Um, there are, of course, future plans. Uh, we'll, we'll believe it when we see it. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of work going into that and look forward to it. And for people who like tinkering with FPGAs, there are also implementations for that. Um, one of the main blockers for the Debian port, uh, let's see. One of the main blockers for the Debian port was fixed recently, and that is getting support into Stable's D package to acknowledge the existence of the RISC-V64 architecture at all. Uh, so that opened the door for several key packages. Uh, the Linux package now has Linux libc dev, uh, glibc was able to be uploaded, and binutils. So a lot of the core tool chain is already available, it no longer requires uh, a porter to do a custom build and then upload that to Debian ports. They can just rebuild uh, the source package from the official Debian archive, uh, simply adding RISC-564 uh, binaries. Um, and uh, there's also, for those who don't have access to hardware, uh, Kimu support was recently added, and I kind of did some nudging to get that into Debian a little earlier, uh, which is maybe one of my more, more significant contributions, though I mostly just nudged patches to happen quicker. Um, 
And very, very recently, mostly because of the dpkg change, uh, you can actually even use regular old dbootstrap uh, to at least get a min-based variant uh, without, uh, without having to pull in the unreleased portion of the Debian ports archive. Um, and that's probably about all I really have going on right now. Uh, so if you would like to chime in or uh, bring up some ideas, issues. Yeah, hi, this is BDL. Um, one of the things that's sort of important to understand in RISC-V space is that while the instruction set architecture is a completely open architecture and an open design, the actual implementation of that into a particular chip may or may not stay really open and without binary stuff. Um, I have one of the Sci-5 Unleashed boards with me. If you haven't seen one before and you'd like to see one up close and personal, I'll be happy to pass this around as long as I get it back. Uh, this one was expensive because it's one of the very first ones that was sent out. Um, but the problem is the Sci-Fi folks have happily pulled in um, uh, intellectual property from other places to get to where the it's a complete chip that does useful things. This is a quad-core 64-bit processor with reasonable performance for playing around and doing Linux stuff. but. Um, the chip's implementation is not particularly open. It has sort of the same level of documentation about how everything works that other people's processor chips have. And it's based on RISC-V, which makes it a reasonable platform for doing RISC-V development. But this chip itself is certainly not transparent in terms of all of its content and how all of its peripheral bits work. Um, that's why my personal interest is sort of leaning more towards uh, in the long term, can we actually get to the point where we have implementations that are completely open and that are either the chips are being developed by people that we know and trust and, and are willing to, you know, sort of collaborate with on future development or, um, you know, in some way we end up with chips where we can actually sort of trust what the content is all the way down to the sand. Uh, to that end, I've been playing around with some of the FPGA targeting stuff, and I have with me one of the Digilent boards that's the um, default target for use with the low-risk version of RISC-V, <coughs> which is another FPGA targeting thing um, akin to the, the rocket things that you mentioned in the wiki. Uh, if folks want to look at that board, you're welcome to. This is a relatively inexpensive board. I, I heard someone talking a couple of days, I, you were talking about actually targeting a, a lattice part with a completely open tool chain. I would love to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. And I have it in my head that it might be really, really interesting for us to find or pick some <coughs> uh, or make uh, some board that has a suitably large, suitably fast uh, FPGA that we can target with a completely open tool chain to not only collaborate on making a Debian port that works better, but maybe in this community there's enough enthusiasm that we could collaborate on a chip implementation that was completely open too. Because I worry that the existing FPGA targeting communities that are trying to do completely open things are right now sort of silos. They're each working on the things they care about. And maybe someplace like Debian is where some of this could come together and we could have a, a larger, more collaborative approach. Anyway, that's enough for me. Yeah, yeah. Fidel made a great point that uh, there is a piece of these chips that is open, but uh, there are other parts. Although, uh, uh, to sort of play the apologist here, I think uh, it's great to see any major component o opened, and it sort of creates the, uh, it sort of breaks the chicken and egg problem and gives you something to hang all of those other buses on top of and all of the other chips. So. I'm a big fan of incremental uh, improvement, and uh, so in that sense, I, I think it's still a great step forward. Um, but yeah, there are some currently non-free components that uh, are attached to the RISC-V chips. Ah. Anybody else? Has anyone in the room been running RISC V port or tried to run it? Besides Bidale? 
So what spec are these boards so far? Right, the, the Hi5 Unleashed uh, has about eight gigs of RAM. I think a processor that can run in the 1.2 to maybe as high as 1.5 gigahertz range, uh, quad core. Uh, they don't have much in the way of IO. Uh, so uh, you pretty much, they, they have gigabit ethernet, um, but uh, uh, they have, you know, your typical dev board uh, connect a whole bunch of just about anything to it. So, yeah, so I didn't bring it because it's too big and too heavy to put in a carry-on bag, but um, one of the things the Sci-Fi folks collaborated with Micro Semi on is there is this huge expansion board for the Sci-Fi Unleashed, and I have one of those too. And what it basically does is extend the, it's kind of open, but seems weird to me, um, serial interface bus thing off the processor through a, a big chunk of micro semi programmable logic um, to implement the things you normally expect to have, PCI, all that kind of stuff. And that board has a lot of I.O. on it, the ability to hook up, you know, real disk drives and video cards and stuff like that. But the Sci-5 Unleashed board by itself, it's basically a, you know, a Cat5 connector and not a whole lot else in the way, and, and a um, micro SD slot and not a whole lot else that seems useful. Right. Um, Merker from IRC was talking about some of the FPGA implementations, uh, noting that uh, the ICE 40 series is probably too small to actually build a RISC-V chip that's Linux capable. Um, Project Trellis is a, a similar FPGA bitstream uh, that looks promising, targeting the ECP5, which would probably be large enough uh, to actually run Linux, I'm, I'm inferring. Um, so it sounds like there are some options. Uh, I am interested, it sounded like there was somebody in the audience who actually had experience doing at least one of the FPGA implementations using the Debian tool chains. Uh, is that correct or did they not show up? because I talked with somebody briefly about it and I'd be really curious to hear. Sounds like they're not here. <laughs> okay. Um, oh. Ah, please uh, grab a mic and... Okay. Uh, I, I accidentally have the the ICE 40 board I mentioned on the IRC, and yes, it doesn't run some kind of uh, Linux or those kind of huge operating system on it, and mostly it can just run some kind of bare metal program that blinks some, some, some LEDs or those kind of stuffs. And uh, the, the complete, the, the open source tool chain, uh, the author of the open source tool chain, Clifford Wolf, is actually working on reverse engineering some Silinx AC something FPGAs and maybe one day when the reverse engineering process is complete, maybe we can have the implementation that is capable of running Linux that day. Great. Let's see. I guess there's a orconf.org links to the status of the free FPGA tool chains. Anything else? Uh, anybody kind of interested in getting involved, uh, cutting their teeth on uh, helping with some of the porting work? Uh, there's the uh, the Debian Risk Five channel on uh, your typical uh, offsee.net server for IRC. Let's see here. So, which which hardware is currently used for build demons? Mm. Um, it's mostly a bunch of. Uh, Kimu virtual machines uh, uh, emulating the hardware, so there isn't, uh, there may be one or two of the Hi5 Unleashed boards just to have at least one bare metal or, you know, actual uh, physical implemented uh, RISC-V board, but they're mostly running Kimu virtual machines. 
Um, so that might possibly introduce, uh, since it's such an early implementation, it, there might be bugs in the, the Kimu emulation. Um, I'm not totally up to speed on what those might look like. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a blocker for uh, inclusion into the proper Debian archive. Yeah, it's not clear to me that we're any near, anywhere near actually putting RISC-V support in the main archive. Um, and I've been involved, you know, as those of you who don't know me, I personally was involved in starting five of Debian's ports back in the day. And so this is something I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, certainly until there's sort of generally available larger volume hardware that, you know, average users could run, uh, pushing really hard to have this be a release architecture doesn't make much sense. Having said that, I know at least one company that's trying to figure out how to build a laptop design around the Sci-5 Unleashed. Um, I think mostly to sort of prove to people that this is a credible thing to want to do. Um, I'm personally, as I said, very interested in driving forward towards, you know, a nicely performant for something like a laptop completely open chip design. Um, I was joking earlier that, you know, putting low risk on an FPGA board, I could do something like put it in my wife's greenhouse with a temperature sensor to, you know, track what's happening out there. And I, I don't know how long it will be before people think it's amusing to actually try and run something like a minimum Debian install to do useful work of one kind or another with RISC-V. And I certainly don't want to hold that back. Um, but right now, I, I also believe that almost everything in the way of building is being done in the QMU environment, because I think it's actually faster than building on real hardware right now, uh, particularly if you have a really fast server to run it on. The, um, but I do know that there are a number of people actually running uh, Debian on Sci-5 Unleashed boards every day. And uh, I ran out of time before I came here, but I intend to put it up on the Unleashed board with the expansion board and see if I can't just, you know, use it as much as I can to help bring all of that out and make sure things are actually working. Uh. I would like to share something that is not related to Debian or Linux, but uh, I posted the link on the IRC that is a micro Python uh, port to the Pico RB32 that is a very tiny and a small RB32 implementation. And I, I, would like to say, I would like to say that it's kind of operating system because it, it has multitask support and it has uh, power abstraction and those kind of stuff. So. In some sense, that is a operating system, but it's very tiny, <laughs> maybe, just saying. Yeah, I think um, one of uh, I think one of the Risk Five Debian people had suggested that the actual the the main advantage with the Kimu board is you, you can actually give it a lot more RAM for a build D, and you actually get. A reasonable speed with the, the I.O. Although uh, even on a fairly fast machine, the, the on a fairly fast x86 machine, Kimu, uh, it, it sounded like maybe actually got comparable performance to running on the real uh, High Five Unleashed board. Maybe you know that for different workflows, obviously it varies, but it they're reasonably close. Uh, maybe a little slower on the real hardware, ironically, but. Uh, hopefully that will eventually change. So what, what kind of work is pending to do? Or right. Good question. <laughs> um, you can go to UDD Debian.org, uh, well actually off of the wiki page is a link to the uh, bugs that are tagged. Um, there are a lot of bugs that are just simple, trivial, like, you know, one to three line patches that uh, maintainers could really, uh, if they just applied it, it would save the, the, RISC, uh, the RISC V64 porters. It's really an unfortunate name. Um, <laughs> Uh, it would save the porters a lot of work uh, of just applying those patches, building it in a custom uh, location, 
building it and then uploading it to Debian ports. Uh, so uh, maybe, how many people have a rough idea of how Debian ports works? Okay, so may maybe even just briefly explaining that. Um, so Debian ports typically has uh, at least two repositories, one of which is just packages rebuilt on the archive, but based exactly the same source, the exact same source as what's in Debian Unstable. Uh, the other repository is where we put our ugly hacks, and that's typically called unreleased. And uh, in many cases, these ugly hacks are actually just small patches that really can't possibly hurt anything in the official Debian packages on other architectures. Uh, so it's just a lot of busy work. Every time a new version gets uploaded, uh, the, the risk porters need to then uh, upload a correspondingly patched version. So one thing that would be really helpful is uh, if you do get a bug about this on one of your packages to apply those patches. Um, I don't know how people would feel about a very gentle NMU campaign to sort of resolve some of those un undealt with bugs. Um, fortunately, most of the real core blockers like uh, the Linux libc and uh, glibc and binutils have uh, recently been patched and uploaded to the official archive. Um, but I think also I don't know off the top of my head exactly which ones, but probably uh, last I checked, System D didn't have support. I don't know if there's an out outstanding patch for it. Uh, but mainly, uh, it'd be nice to actually be able to get a uh, bootstrap, which can only support a single component. Uh, all of the things necessary to debootstrap a base to root uh, would be nice. Uh, right now, you can do a minimal base to root but let's, let's bump it up a step further and maybe target some of the remaining patches necessary to do those. Um, but uh, it is a fairly immature port, port at this point, um, so it's a great time to get in and uh, get a lot of work done, and if that's the kind of thing that motivates you, uh, small changes can make big differences. Yeah, I think talking about how the port stuff works is really useful. Um, and in the same vein, I'll offer, offer up a couple thoughts based on experience about what it takes to actually port packages to a new architecture like this. One of the challenges is that if you look at sort of the build dependency graph for the Debian distribution, it's horribly complicated. And part of the reason it's complicated is we have single source packages that build uh, multiple uh, kinds of outputs. For example, you might have a base essential package that you have to get built before the entire rest of the, the set of packages can be able to be built, but maybe that package also provides documentation that needs some fairly complex document processing tools in order to generate those outputs. And so a lot of the time, what you have to do as a porter is you have to be willing to temporarily do things like hack the source package to just not build any documentation so that you can get a working executable. And we've spent a lot of time over the years coming up with ways to make this easier because we've done a lot of ports now. But if you look at this list, there are a number of places where it's like, you just need to add this architecture to a list of architectures that the package knows about and knows how to configure for. Or um, there, there may even be some packages out there that still have old ways of handling things like config.sub and config.guest versions, which used to be a really huge problem. Um, and so <clears throat> a lot of times when you get down to it, the patch required for package is really, really small once you get past this sort of bootstrapping problem and have enough of the distribution built to have a lot of those other dependencies, uh, build dependencies available for, for building things like documentation and data and all of that stuff that may not be essential for breaking the, the build dependency graph. Uh, are you using uh, build profiles at all? Is that at all helpful? Because that was what this was for. Uh, I believe build profiles are definitely used. A number of the patches recommend, uh, a number of the risk 5 tag patches are basically build profile, like please enable build profile support. Uh, 
Um, I think we're past some of the very basic bootstrapping, and so uh, to some degree it's moving on to more uh, actually, actually we don't need all of the build profiles, but in general, uh, when build profile related bugs are really helpful to bootstrapping ports. Um, oh. um, question. Um, another question on another topic. Um, do people think it would be useful to have the architecture documentation in Debian in a normal package? Because we can't have that for most other architectures. They're mostly proprietary, so. Right. But for this, for this architecture, it's possible. Yeah. Um, also, another thing. Um, Karsten Merker mentioned on IRC was uh, upstream really could use some work on getting the kernel driver bits upstream and a, a, a proper bootloader. I have one other comment. This is going to be very predictable. So I should have known, of course, that, that Debian is itself maintaining several Debian derivatives. Um, your unreleased suite is obviously a Debian derivative. Um, I wrote a tool you may have heard me plugging, which is supposed to help with this kind of thing. Um, maybe people involved with ports stuff should uh, talk to me after the session about how we can make all of this automatically rebasing all of your patches more automatic. I believe you're referring to dget and git deb rebase? Uh, dget. Okay. Um, I saw there was a uh, open risk port at some time. Um, what's the big difference between open risk and risk five? And right, um, my understanding, which uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, was uh, some of the core GCC patches to support open risk. Uh, the the person who wrote the bulk of that uh, actually blocked the some sort of agreement uh, in order to get those patches into GCC upstream. And so basically, there was no possibility of getting the GCC patches upstream. So in that sense, which that's pretty much going to kill any porting effort, at least for a while, until somebody rewrites it from scratch without looking at the other code, which is highly publicly available. So yeah. Um, that was a pretty unfortunate thing. And I know uh, one of the main porters involved in the RISC-V uh, actually uh, was also involved in the open risk port for Debian as well. Yeah. And Merker also mentioned, uh, yeah, no upstream support in the tool chain. So the fact that we have all of the most core major tool chains available uh, upstream in RISC-V is just a huge win, and sometimes that takes a long time for a new port. So any ideas when you think you might be ready to get into the main archive, or maybe a release? I'd uh, want to see some real world uh, Build the capable hardware <laughs> before that's even a dream. Sure, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's kind of hard to say with hardware, especially one that's so new and yet come so far. So it really just takes some vendor to jump in and make that a reality, or maybe some huge community driven crowdfunding campaign. I have no idea. So Bedell says sometime in 2019, maybe. That sounds very awesomely optimistic. <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think once we get some decent build hardware, I, I, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem here too, is like, 
who's going to invest in this open architecture when there's not a working operating system for it. Um, it's maybe a little, you know, other architectures will do that, but maybe it requires some driving force behind it to actually carry that through. I think the attendance in this room shows that's really not going to be much of a problem. Um, but I had a different, I'm sorry, I came in late, so maybe this has already been covered. Um, this, you know, uh, speculative execution has been much in the news. As I understand it, the current RISC-V calls don't do out of order, so aren't vulnerable. Um, does anybody have any uh, uh, knowledge about whether that's in fact true and what yeah. the future plans of anybody that's um, making designs are? Because I know the architecture was designed to support out of order, but that's starting to look like a thing that you might want to, you know, ask questions about. You might prefer more slower cores, for example. Right. As far as I know, there are no implementations that support out of order execution, and obviously uh, going to be hesitant to actually bother building any at this point. I hope. Well, this is part of the reason I think it'd be awesome if we could actually see the guts of the processors that are coming along the pike. And, and you know, I didn't mean any slight to the sci-fi folks earlier. I'm really thrilled that they built the chip they did and that that board's available. But I hope that people aren't confused in the belief that that's what all we ever really want. Um, with respect to the um, sort of chicken and egg problem, the vagrant, um, I can report that the people that are um, thinking about doing things like building laptop designs around RISC-V are already really, really excited about the fact that the Debian port has gotten as far as it has as quickly as it has. And I think that that has sort of proven the sort of, there's a sense that the operating system port is already viable even though it's in Debian ports and not in the main tree. And I think that, that I, I really want to thank everybody that's been working on the port so far because it really has um, enabled folks that are thinking about doing business things around RISC-V to feel like there is a credible likelihood of being able to ship stuff that runs Debian. I'm really encouraged by this. There's two... Um, kind of ways of looking at that. One is it's, it's really really good for RISC-V, which I like because I'm really keen to have open hardware. Um, but also, I, f I think that in Debian, we sometimes underestimate our, uh, you know, our influence and our ability to, to change things, our ability to um, maybe disagree with other people and do our own thing. Um, and, you know, this, this kind of thing, this is, this is us making a big strategic impact in um, in like the CPU architecture, in like the CPU marketplace. Um, we are making something possible that would otherwise be very difficult. Um, and we're doing it for all the right reasons. So I'm very, I'm very proud of everybody else here in the room. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, somebody mentioned, uh, is there anybody from Andy's Technology who wants to say something? I know they're based in Sinchu Science Park and uh, maybe got nudged to show up. Uh, I know they do manufacture some RISC uh, five chips. Guessing that's Hello. oh yeah. hello. We are the, we are the tech. Ah, cool. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, in fact, I don't know how to say. It. What? We have our LPGA boards, and yes, uh, it can run the Linux for the risk flight, yes. Mm, but steadily, our company don't intend to sell the board, so I think it's the main problem in the RISC-V world is only the sci-fi guy are intended to build the board to sell to uh, other than the company, so I I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I think Sci-Fi even they at least some of them have told me they don't actually want to be making boards. They just wanted to get something out there to kind of seed the world plan so that people actually start doing this stuff. But yeah, because there is almost no profit. <laughs>
So in that sense, it might suggest um, moving towards some sort of crowdfunding effort, but that's a non-trivial task. Uh, somebody in the back uh, use a mic. Uh, just follows uh, the end this talk. Um, is uh, is there any public uh, uh, example or demo we could find on the internet uh, that is uh, running strong on your uh, end this core? We we send we send many patches to the Linux kernel, and for our port, uh, in our SOC, we may upstreaming our implementation to QEMU uh, in recently the months I guess. Okay, so uh, that way you may run the Linux on our QEMU implementation. Yes. And in our FPGA, but I'm not sure the, the schedule, yes. And we, we may provide a MCU version uh, to run some kind of Arduino compatible programs in, in the FPGA both, but there is no MMU in it. Uh, Niku mentions from IRC, what are the options for security applications that need a multi-core RISC-V SOC capable of running Linux but still need an MMU? Don't need multi-core, correction. Um, anybody know of anything like that? No? All right. Um, it, are the Andes tech, those are 32-bit RISC-V? Or do, are you also making 64-bit versions? Uh, we implement 32 and 64 version. Ah. Yes, and we, we send GLibc patches for uh, RISC-V 32 for the last few months. And Palmer said he would, he would do the following patch sets. Uh, he, he, uh, we, we sent the version three, yes, and he said he would, he would follow the, uh, yes, he, he would do doing the following things, yes. Cool. Uh, it's really great to see projects doing the work to push stuff upstream. Uh, in fact, that's astounding. Uh, I know in certain other architectures that sometimes happens, but uh, really exciting to see that with RISC-V. There have been a couple of uh, public comments in this DevConf earlier um, about the uh, fact that we're sort of starting with the 64-bit port, um, because of course that's what's of greatest interest to the most of us going forward. And there was at least an implication that maybe Debian wouldn't do a RISC-V 32-bit port. Um, I commented at the time that I think we're going to have to be careful about that attitude because as we go forward uh, with public pronouncements by people like Martin Fink, who's the CTO at Western Digital and happens to have been my boss at a certain point in history, um, he made a big public announcement about Western Digital's commitment to using RISC-V and future products. And I think that that means that we're going to see in the industry a number of 32-bit implementations of RISC-V embedded in various devices that we might very well want to be able to use, uh, you know, to repurpose that silicon, or maybe we might be able to get access to, you know, low-cost 32-bit implementations that are fun for doing embedded network edge security, whatever kinds of devices. And so um, I'm not jumping on the bandwagon to push starting a 32-bit port before we get 64 bits in good shape, that would be ludicrous. But um, I do want people to sort of keep an open mind about the fact that there may come a time when doing a 32-bit, you know, a risk a risk v 32 architecture in Debian makes a heck of a lot of sense. We'll see. Yeah. 
course, there's also the plausibility of a 128-bit port. Could be the first. <laughs> But yes, focus on one at a time. So what, what are people's personal interests in RISC-V? Do you hope to run it on, someday maybe run it as your primary computing platform, as an interesting little hobby? as uh, you know, a handheld device? Like, anybody have any hopes, dreams, visions? Yes, all of those. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's a, a distinct call for freedom in the room. I think um, there's nothing wrong with speculation. You'd um, if you can verify the um, layout of the of the CPU, so I want to use a CPU where there's which is at least uh, tested and can be uh, reviewed um, to find some security holes. So, speaking as someone with experience from previous new architecture ports. Please tell me you've got things like ABI nailed down, you've got cross-distro agreement for things like your in ELF interpreter path and whatever. I do think, uh, I think at least Fedora is also targeting the same uh, instruction set with all of the extra bells and whistles, the same bells and whistles. Uh, I'm not positive <laughs> and uh, I, I know they they did a port once and they did it kind of the hard way uh, and then they had to redo it. Debian's also, this is maybe the second major iteration of the Debian port for RISC-V. Um, so yeah, I think it's pretty much nailed down. I know, uh, I also know like the sci-fi folks in particular have really been like, uh, we want to push they, they kind of wanted to get a piece of hardware out there to sort of also solidify the spec to some degree. Yeah, there's a, there's a risk here, Steve, that things could, you know, if we're not careful, and if as dis, you know, a distribution we don't sort of make our thoughts about such things known and, and, and through action sort of follow through on this, all this, it could be much worse than the ARM situation and the kernel was at one point in history because you know, even the base architecture is wide open. And if somebody really wants to go create, you know, risk six or risk, risk 42 or whatever, um, there, there's ample opportunity to do that. But I think you and I and everyone else who's been playing this game long enough understands that for there to be critical mass and for us to be able to do things like build and maintain a distribution, there has to be some consistency, some uniformity, some willingness to, for people to come together and standardize. And so I hope that by getting involved early and building a distribution around a particular ABI that, you know, until and unless somebody comes along and says, here's why we really, really, really want to change that and why it's going to make the world a substantially better place, that we won't see the kind of silly diversification that drove us nuts with IO structures on ARM for a while, for example, and which finally is somewhat rationalizing. So. Yeah, there's an opportunity to get it right, but there's also an opportunity to really screw it up when we have all the knobs. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, is there, for example, a cross, a, a, a cross distro list to discuss this kind of thing, or is it way too early? It's probably a little early, but I think people, I, I, I've seen conversations back and forth with at least Fedora folks. I don't know if there's actually, like, lists. Sure. So if, if there isn't such a thing, I would strongly recommend start one and invite the other people to get involved. You know, it's easier to discuss this kind of thing early and make sure that, for example, you get binary, you know, binary... The, the answer to the question's on the screen okay, there. Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, great. Make sure you have a cross-distro forum so you can discuss things as they come up rather than a year later and realize, oh, crap, we need to rebuild. Right, definitely. Um, yeah, um, I want to put a thanks out to Karsten Merker for showing up on IRC, who's more actively involved in the RISC-V port uh, than I am, but uh, woke up stupid early to, uh, to attend, so 
Thanks. Um, yeah, we're pretty much wrapping up. Yeah. Thank you all for coming, and uh, let's keep this thing real. <laughs>